Good evening. If everybody can now uh, have their seat and we'd like to get, uh, get started, uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, Turo's fifth annual Pampered and Pink event, uh, an evening where we celebrate all things women's health. Uh, my name is Manny Linares. I'm the president and CEO of Turo, and it's wonderful uh, to have uh, and to see such a great turnout uh, to an event that is absolutely so special uh, to us. This year holds even a more significance as it's our first in-person per event in 19 months. Um, I know I started at Turo in July of 2019, and my very first event was in October of 2019, and it was the Pampered and Pink event, and I will uh, always remember it, and it is such a special event. Um, and I am so happy to be able to be here and to, for us to all be here in person and be able to, to celebrate um, um, everything that we do to care for our breast uh, cancer patients. Um, so as you know, during Breast Cancer Awareness Month, we focus on celebrating the survivors. So at this time, uh, I'd like to ask all the cancer survivors to stand and be recognized. How about a round of applause? Thank you for inspiring us with your strength, perseverance, and hope. Uh, at Turo, we think about cancer every day of the year. Our patients are a top priority, and our cancer care team is there so to support them every step of the way. So I'd like to also ask our cancer care team to stand and thank them for their commitment to our patients. I mean, there has to be a lot more. Thank you. This event would not be possible without the support of the Hebe Family Fund through the Turo Infirmary Foundation. The Hebe Family Fund, which was created in honor of Mimi Hebe, uh, who courageously battled cancer, is proud to support this event in an effort to educate New Orleans women on important women's health issues and what you can do to stay healthy. I want to thank Odom Hebe for supporting this event and services that promote health and well-being. Odom, if you could have. <laughs> Cancer doesn't discriminate. Everyone in this room has been affected by cancer either directly or indirectly. Screenings and preventive care are key to successful diagnosis and treatment. I encourage you all to be proactive in your health care and make your well-being a priority. We have an exciting night, great food, drinks, pampering, shopping, and valuable information on women's health, so please enjoy this evening. It is a very special evening. With that, it is my pleasure to welcome our MC for the evening. Most of you will recognize our MC as she graces our television screens on a daily basis, WDSU News anchor, Christina Watkins. Christina. Thank you so much, Manny. Good evening, everybody. Okay, no. Mm -mm. We're going to run that back. Good evening, everybody. There we go. It is my pleasure and my true honor to welcome you all to the fifth annual Pampered in Pink at Audubon Zoo event. Let's just give everyone a round of applause for the incredible work that they put in. I had privilege and the opportunity to MC this event back in 2019. It was so much fun. I was so inspired. I had a ball. I hope you all did too. And I'm so excited to be back tonight, especially after the last 19 months we've had. So great to see each and every one of you in person. I actually said to someone tonight, I said, are, are we hugging? Are, are we hugging yet? Because I miss embracing so many people. So it's an honor to see all of you tonight. We do ask 
that you keep your mask on because keeping everybody safe is of course the top priority so we remind you to do so unless you are actively eating or drinking so we certainly thank you all for following that guidance tonight we know things may look just a little bit different limited guests kind of spaced out we're trying to distance right but we know we are going to have a fantastic event if there's one thing this past year and a half has taught us which it's taught me a lot I can say that I'm sure it's taught each and every one of you a lot as well it is certainly the importance of health that's one thing that I've learned throughout this last year and a half trying to prioritize that get everything together go to my regular checkups make sure that I'm in my doctor's office and calling them for every little thing we're so lucky to have an incredible panel of physicians for us here tonight to answer your questions about health and provide you all the valuable information that you need to stay healthy and to pass along to others in your circle or within your family. So it's going to be a fantastic night. We have an incredible team of medical experts who will share all of the important and useful health information that you need. And then we're gonna open it up for questions from you all. Don't be shy. Please don't be shy. If you have any questions as you hear them talking tonight, write it down if you need to. Take a little mental note because we are going to get to you and we would love for you to get the chance to ask our panel of experts whatever questions you have. We need this to be interactive and extremely informative. Okay? Okay? All right. I love it. You all look beautiful tonight, by the way, and I love all the smiles. Yes, I can see them underneath your masks. It's your eyes. Your eyes are smiling, and I, I hope that you all are excited to be here and enjoying all the food and the drinks. Let's go ahead and welcome our incredible panel of experts from Toro. Let's begin with Dr. Brianne Anderson, who is an OBGYN. Please give her a round of applause. <laughs> Dr. John Colfrey, who is a breast surgical oncologist. Dr. Natalie Fitton, who is a radiologist. <laughs> Dr. Shiler Williams, internal medicine physician. Dr. George Zachariah, hematologist oncologist. And Dr. Ellie Zachritz, who is a radiation oncologist. Give our panel of experts a round of applause. Thank you all again so much for your time tonight. We appreciate you and let's go ahead and get right to it because there are a lot of questions. And again, at the very end of this, we will open up the floor to you all. So please do not hesitate to ask any question. Dr. Fitton, I wanna start with you. So we know October is all about breast health. And one of the most important things to determine breast health and how you do so is through screening mammograms. What are some of the current recommendations on screening guidelines and when should women start getting these mammograms? So great question, something I'm very passionate about. Every woman of average risk for breast cancer should begin screening at 40 and continue every year and as long as she's still in good health. There are certain populations of people that are at higher risk for breast cancer. So if you have a family history or other factors, you should talk to your doctor about when um, is best for you to start screening. Dr. Williams, let's talk about your role as a primary care physician. We know that you are often on the front line for breast care. You are ordering images. You are also counseling patients on breast care. Talk about the importance of your role in women's health and why establishing a primary physician for all of your annual wellness visits should be a priority. Yeah, I think primary care physicians play a very important role in women's health care. I like to think of your annual preventative visit as being like the foundation for your current health and your future health. So I encourage all patients to schedule to have these visits annually so that we can talk through their medical history, their family history, also so that I can perform a comprehensive assessment and screening labs. From there, we can make decisions on what screening tests might be most appropriate, um, as well as talk about what vaccines are indicated. So uh, really an annual preventative visit is very important, especially for women. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. Dr. Anderson, let's talk about some of the things you go through oftentimes as an OBGYN. You may be the only provider sometimes a woman sees regularly. How would you say breast health is addressed through OBGYN visits? And what advice can you give your patients or any patient for that matter on approaching a breast health conversation with their OBGYNs? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so breast health is something that I incorporate into our um, well woman or our annual exams. So whenever a patient comes in and we're doing an exam, I always say, hey, I'm gonna check your breast. Is that okay with you? Do you do this on a regular basis? Do you have any concerns? Do you have a family history of breast or ovarian cancer? And depending on those answers, we may talk about earlier screening or have you had your first mammogram yet? A girl, when was your last mammogram? So it should be a pretty comfortable situation for you to talk to your OBGYN about and just make sure when you go to your woman visits that you address it with them. Excellent answer, Dr. Anderson. Thank you. Dr. Colfrey, let's talk about the next steps after a patient is diagnosed with breast cancer. You are often one of the first physicians the patient will meet to talk about their treatment. How does that conversation typically go and what decisions are made in that initial visit? Yeah, first of all, I just want to say this is a special night. I, I'm glad to see everybody out. I never thought, you know, two years ago when all this was going down with the pandemic that we would all be able to gather like this. I mean, I'll answer your question in a second, but I mean, we have some just warriors in this room that need to be recognized. It's, 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 it's one thing to fight breast cancer, period. It's another thing to fight breast cancer in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of a 100-year flood, and when you're pregnant, and when you're down and out. And I'm just, I'm proud to, to be here and look out at all of you. And uh, anyway, it's just, this is, it's special. But uh, to get back to your question, we are the first sort of person that sees the patient after they've had a diagnosis from our great breast center. I like, kind of the system that we have set up. Uh, we work with some great radiologists who sort of are the first lines of breaking the news. And so that gives our patients a little while to digest everything so that when they come to see me, they have the diagnosis and it's time to make a battle plan and move forward. Um, and so some of the first things we talk about is really what type of breast cancer do you have? They're, many different subtypes, and that's really the most important thing that we do is find out what subtype it is and then parcel off the treatment from there. Um, so that's usually what our first visit looks like and making a game plan and, and trying to let our patients know that this is you know, something that's gonna be manageable and we're gonna be there with you every step of the way. And we have the team up here and in the audience that helps us every day do it. So sorry for the long answer. But. <laughs> well, actually, there's a second part to that question, Dr. Colfrey. What would you say are some of the surgical options available for women who are on that battlefield and they are battling breast cancer? Right. And, you know, it's a, it's a case by case basis. It used to be breast cancer was very much just the kitchen sink. Everybody came in, they got one thing, they left. Now it's tailored to what type of breast cancer you have, how old are you, what's your family history. Surgical options can be anything from a simple lumpectomy, removing the problem spot, to a double mastectomy with, with reconstruction with some of our great plastic surgeons that are here. Um, and so there, there are a myriad of options, but the, the take home message is it's individualized per patient. It's no longer just a kitchen sink uh, diagnosis. And I'd also like to echo what Dr. Colfrey said in acknowledging every single frontline worker who has been in the thick of it for the last 19 months. Uh, every single one of you are truly remarkable. We're, it's, you all are a blessing. Um, let's go to Dr. Zachariah. Oftentimes when women hear breast cancer, they automatically think, first of all, probably, oh no. Secondly, chemotherapy and radiation. What can patients expect from radiation, in particular during their treatment at Toro, and talk about some of the benefits from radiation? I think that's, I think that's Dr. Zacharis. Yeah, we have very have confusing you, names. You, the same. you are correct. My apologies. That's uh, okay. Dr. Zachariah, the question that I have for you, we'll get to in a second, but Dr. Zacharis, if you can answer that, please. Sure. Thank it, you. Is my mic on? So <laughs> at, 
At Tora, what you can expect is pers in the uh, radiation department and elsewhere is personalized, compassionate, and state-of-the-art care. We have the most sophisticated radiation technology. We, um, we practice national cancer NCCN guidelines um, or evidence-based medicine. We have techniques to spare the heart and lungs when a woman is getting left breast radiation. Um, so not to sound like a commercial, but um, we have a fabulous department and not every woman with breast cancer needs radiation, but what radiation does in, um, in collaboration with surgery, some women get chemotherapy, immunotherapy, hormonal therapy, um, every woman gets surgery, but in addition, if, if we recommend radiation, it's just to further reduce the chance of the cancer ever coming back. So it's not anything anyone needs to be afraid of. Um, the techniques we have now are much, much, much improved compared to 20 years ago. Dr. Zachariah, let's talk about chemotherapy in regards to breast cancer. Is chemo always required, and how do you all go about determining that? So uh, that's, a, that's a great question, and I think to echo what Dr. Colfrey said, the important thing is recognizing that there's different subtypes of breast cancer. A lot of women, they think breast cancer, they think chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, just standard. Um, but the truth is there's different subtypes, and within those subtypes is variability. And how we treat breast cancer now is not different, is, is much different than we treated it five years ago, definitely 10 years ago. I think anybody that knows somebody that had breast cancer 10, 15 years ago, pretty much everybody got chemo. It's hard to know somebody uh, that had breast cancer 10, 15 years ago that didn't get chemo. But recognizing that there's different biology within each subtype, we know that different cancers act differently. And um, actually a specific subtype called hormone sensitive or estrogen positive, about 70% of women can be spared chemo now with breakthroughs and uh, looking at the actual genetic makeup of that individual tumor. So not everybody needs uh, chemotherapy. And I'm fortunate to be working in a time where I can tell patients that, hey, you don't need chemotherapy. We can just do a, a pill and you'll be fine. Wow. I want to remind you all, um, you can follow up after we're done with our panel of questions and ask whatever follow-up questions you may have. There will be time for that at the end, so please don't be shy. Take your notes, take a mental note, whatever you may have for our panel of experts at the end of this. Please, we will open up the floor to you, and we can't wait to hear from you. Dr. Fenton, let's talk about women who previously had breast cancer and are now in remission. How does their imaging differ? Do they need those mammograms more frequently? And are other imaging diagnostic tests required? So that's a great question. While most people that I will diagnose with breast cancer will never have a recurrence, it is so important that we continue those annual screenings for those women to ensure that if something were to arise, we are able to catch that as the earliest possible state and get it taken care of immediately. So first and foremost, getting an annual mammogram is essential. That's really the most important part. And also to really echo what some of the other presenters have been discussing, it is so personalized now. Depending on when you were diagnosed, the age, the type of breast cancer, and also whether um, you have dense breast tissue or not and how sensitive that mammogram will be for you. A lot of people will um, benefit from having supplemental screening tests on an annual basis as well, just so that we're able to look at the breast tissue in multiple different ways. And at Toro, we have all of the latest technology in order to do that so that everyone will be able to get that personalized approach. Dr. Anderson, let's talk about some of the cancer survivors here. Uh, certain cancer treatments can lead to early menopause. How do you help your patients navigate this and what can you tell them to expect? So menopause for some women is a very scary word, but there are treatments outside of hormone therapy. And it's not um, something that we can't do something about. 
there's um, SSRIs, there's a common treatment called Brisdel or paroxetine that I often prescribe for patients, even if there's issues with maybe vaginal dryness and there are other things besides estrogen that you can use. There's moisturizers, there's lots of over-the-counter things as well. And if you're using something and it's not working, then we can always talk with your oncologist and see if a short-term treatment of something else that maybe contains a hormone may be beneficial for you. So sometimes it's a collaborative effort, but there are options. Dr. Williams, um, this next question, I think we all, well, I know we all can relate to, stress. It is known to cause a lot of health problems in women. I myself experienced this. I'm sure we all have, especially the past two years of itself. Uh, it's caused an increase in stress in every single one of us, but especially women as the caretakers of the family. What do you recommend patients do to try and lower our stress, ease that stress a little bit? And what health benefits have you seen as a result of just <sighs> taking a breath? That's a great question. Um, well, what medical literature has shown time and time again is that high levels of stress are associated with an increased risk of certain medical conditions that we see commonly in clinic like hypertension, obesity, and heart disease. Um, so when I'm talking with patients in clinic and assessing their stress levels, it's really important that we're finding a method for managing stress that's effective for each individual patient. Um, so for everyone, that conversation goes a little bit differently. I can say that some techniques that I find people frequently have benefit with um, would be um, with meditation, outdoor activities, getting a lot of physical exercise, um, as well as with breathing exercises at home. Yeah, my Apple Watch tells me to breathe all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Colfrey, uh, let's talk about another hot topic in the breast cancer community. It often surrounds genetic testing and the breast cancer genes. These are things you all have likely heard about. Um, how often is breast cancer gene related and what patients would you say specifically need to get genetic testing? One of the most important things, and I think I said this two years ago when we were all here, is just making sure you know your family history. Um, and there are a lot of families out there that actually don't talk about this kind of stuff. There are a lot of families still that this is kind of taboo to, to know what cancers were in your family or what your grandmother passed away from. But it's, it's important and empowering to know your family cancer history because that's really how we tell who needs genetic testing or not. Um, so things that take priority for genetic testing would be first degree relatives with breast cancer. So a mother or a sister. Second and third degree relatives we pay attention to uh, like aunts or grandparents but it, it doesn't get our attention as much as you know, first degree relatives. So I'd say anybody that has a first degree relative, um, anybody that was diagnosed with breast cancer young, young meaning 50 or less, um, some of it depends too again on what type of breast cancer you have. Triple negative breast cancers is a certain subtype that can be associated with genetic predisposition to getting more breast cancers and to passing it on to your family. So those people get tested at every age. Um, so I don't know that I have, it used to be, you know, a simple answer, but now it's kind of more of a, we apply it on a case by case basis, but knowing your family history is certain the, certainly the first step. And Dr. Colfrey, when it comes to your screening recommendations, how does having a gene in your family change that? Right. I mean, a family history with breast cancer or a family member that has the gene for breast cancer or if, or if you yourself have the gene for breast cancer, screening can look a little bit different. Sometimes we'll add an, a, an additional MRI to your yearly screening. So for some of our patients, they'll have a mammogram and six months later, they'll have an MRI. Some patients with the gene elect to have preventative surgery so they don't develop breast cancer, uh, perhaps like their mother did. Um, so it does change the screening recommendations a little bit. Dr. Zechariah, you briefly talked about this, but if you can elaborate a little bit more on chemotherapy. We know that it is often viewed as one of the most uh, difficult treatments of cancer for the patient because of the side effects that can often come from the medicine. But as you mentioned, there have been great advancements in medicine and there are so many options available to try and mitigate those side effects that can come from chemo. 
How would you say, in your own words, chemo for breast cancer treatment evolved over the last decade? So there's good news and bad news, I guess, with that. Uh, unfortunately, chemo is still chemo, and that, so certain drugs haven't necessarily changed. We do have more targeted therapies that are still being called chemo, even though they're not actually chemo, and sometimes they're given with chemo. So we have different strengths of chemo, more aggressive regimens, milder regimens, um, but the chemo backbone is still somewhat the same. But identifying different subsets of cancers, we're able to target treatment and have less toxicity. I think the biggest thing that's happened is how we uh, support the side effects that can occur with, with chemotherapy. So the old movies where you see people throwing up constantly or just being bedridden for, for weeks at a time or uh, unable to function, uh, that's very, very rare. Um, I have patients that will tell me if they you know, didn't lose their hair, they wouldn't even know that they're, they're getting chemo. So uh, I think how we handle the side effects of chemo is really what's, what's changed. Um, the other thing I think that we do really well is uh, patient education. So it's not just getting chemo and then seeing what the side effects are, is how does a patient uh, understand what's possible to happen? And um, do they have the, the tools at their disposal, whether it's medication for nausea or medication for, um, for this side effect or that? And so we educate our patients. Our nurses are great to ask them the questions to proactively get ahead of anything before it becomes a problem. Um, so I think all of those reasons um, or all those things come into play when it comes to, to chemotherapy side effects. Isn't science amazing? <laughs> Dr. Zacharis, uh, we want to round the panel of questions out with you before we open it up to the floor. Let's talk about breast cancer survivorship. It is a huge part of the recovery process, not only following breast cancer, but also during treatment. What programs are there in place at Toro to help those who are recovering from breast cancer treatment? And what would you recommend to your patients for other support services? So at Toro, um, survivorship or, or living with breast cancer or after a breast cancer treatment and support services is extremely important. We have a, we have a lot of different support programs. Um, we have two support groups a gynecologic support group and a survivorship support group that will be live again next month. We have a Facebook book support group for our younger um, cancer survivors. It's called START. Survive, Thrive, and Recover Together. Um, we, give, we, we give every patient a, um, a summary of their care and a care plan uh, for aftercare after treatment. We give out wig vouchers. We have a nutri nutrition program. We have transportation assistance. We have a smoking cessation program. Um, we're like a family and we walk together. Um, this month we're uh, all participating in a walk called Sister Strut. Um, I'm looking over at our two support care uh, tables. I mean, and everyone uh, in, in our cancer support is here tonight, and that says a lot too. Um, we have a fabulous cancer rehab program, and we have Lindsay and Erica here tonight. Our rehab program is nationally accredited and really one of the best in the nation. We have, I think, the only um, program for neuropathy or a side effect that can affect your nerves related to chemotherapy and we get patients from all over the state that come to Toro. Um, we also have a um, way to try to limit hair loss with chemotherapy and it's a scalp cooling uh, system that not all um, centers have. We also have seminars on living um, after breast cancer um, and you know what to expect and we hope to grow our survivorship program um, we'd love feedback from our patients so we know what you know you want to have more of um, we have we have resources available in the community for massage and other complementary therapies acupuncture um, different you know herbal uh, rent remedies so um, we're here for you, and we're here to help you live better um, after the diagnosis. Oh, we also have amazing plastic surgery, so if anyone um, is unhappy or um, they can make us all look better. 
<laughs> I love it. Incredible. We'd like to go ahead and open the floor now to any questions from you, our audience. And again, do not be shy. Just go ahead and raise your hand if you have any questions. We do have a microphone to provide for you. Don't be shy. Just raise your hand if you have a question. I'll go ahead and start. I'll start. Let's see. So, um, and, and this can, can really be for anyone in general who feels it's best for you to answer. When we talk about if you don't have a family history of breast cancer, some of the stories we've covered this month include a lot of women who have been diagnosed without any family history. What could bring that on and, and what should a woman, let's say maybe 30 on up, um, start to look for or pay attention to any signs that they need to be aware of if they don't have any family history, yet they end up being diagnosed with, with breast cancer? Yeah, I'll take that one because I think you had asked me that in one of my questions and it didn't really answer. Actually, only 10% of the breast cancers come from the gene. Uh, and so 90% of the breast cancer that, that happens, we don't know why it happens. It's some sort of environmental trigger. Uh, we, we don't know. And I get that question all the time. Um, but believe it or not, only 10% is, is genetically inherited or passed down. So the other 90% some sort of environmental factor. Um, I mean, I think one of the biggest things that we always encourage our patients to do is to be active, as some of our other physicians up here have said. Um, a lot of the 90, well, let's see, 70 percent of the breast cancers are driven by estrogen, the hormone estrogen. And we like our patients exercising, doing cardio, because when you're doing that, you're actually burning extra fat cells and extra fat cells make more estrogen. And again, 70% of the cancers are fed by estrogen. So we like you doing cardio. We usually tell people at least five days a week for 30 minutes if you could. Um, so I think that's one of the most important things you can do to protect yourself if you don't have a family history. Uh, watching your diet, and we have a great, one of our great dietitians is here. Um, you know, and she'll probably criticize me for saying it like this. I don't mean to make it sound simple, but high protein diet, chicken, fish, vegetables, watching the amount of fat in your diet, fried food in your diet. Certainly, it's okay to cheat. We live in the best city in the world, uh, <laughs> best foodie city in the world. So we all cheat. But I guess the point is in moderation with everything. And I don't know if anybody else up here wants to add anything. We are also opening the floor to questions from the audience. Just raise your hand, anything, anything at all. I'll ask one. There we go. So, you know, we always talk about, I worry about, I have a daughter and two sons that are 19, 20, and 21, right? And so my daughter is again screening just to, have a, just to have a base, just because of Mimi's situation. She had cancer first when she was 26. It came back with a vengeance when the kids were one, two, and three. But I never thought about this until lately, but what about the boys? I mean, do they have a precondition? I use it to tell them, like, you can't vape, don't smoke, don't do any of these things. You know, you've got a history of this, but is there something real there? Do they have more of a chance to have cancer as a boy with their mother being a breast cancer? I, I think the, one of the things would just be making sure that the original patient did not have the breast cancer gene. And so if there was a genetic test done and it was negative, then your son would not have any risk, no. And, and wouldn't have any risk of passing that on to his children one day. But I can still use it for the smoking. <laughs> you can still use it for the smoking. <laughs> <laughs> I believe we have a question in the back from one of our members here in the audience. We have a microphone coming to you. Hello, my name is Trishelle Bowman. And I actually take advantage of a lot of the programs that's offered at Turo. I participate in cancer rehab. Um, I meet with Vera. Um, I do cardiac rehab. I also take advantage of doing IV hydrations. And I really want to thank Turo for everything that you all do for us patients because it means so much to me to have the support and all the staff that i've encountered has been wonderful 
And I really want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart for everything that you do. The physicians, I actually see Dr. Zachariah and Dr. Colfrey. They are two of my physicians. Um, and the information that they give is great. Um, my question is for Dr. Colfrey. Um, after um, you have reconstructive um, surgery, uh, once the port is taken out and Lord forbid cancer does come back, um, how do they handle that? Are you able to get the port in the reconstructive breast or are you limited to having just the needle, um, the IV? Great question. Um, you know, when it, when it happens that you're diagnosed with breast cancer for a second time, even after a double mastectomy, um, you know, it's very upsetting because you've just done all this to survive and now you gotta do it all again. And it's one of the toughest things that we see. But again, as I alluded to earlier, we have a bunch of tough people in this room and we, can, we double down on it, just, just like you do. We do the same thing. And so, you know, when, you're, when you have a recurrence like that, first step is mapping everything out where is it? Second step is, did it go anywhere else? So we'll get a full body scan on you. And then if you would need more treatment, if you would need more chemotherapy, uh, we do put the port right back in the same place that it was originally, you know, on the same side and everything. And whether you've had reconstruction or not, it, it doesn't affect that. Um, and again, kind of like Dr. Zachariah said, some people need different things. If you have a recurrence, sometimes we can just excise it and you do a little radiation with Dr. Zacharis and Dr. Harmon and you're fine. Sometimes you need that and some chemotherapy. Uh, so it, 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 again, it's the whole picture. Um, but to answer your specific question, the port can go back, right back in the same place. Um, I think it was Dr. Fenton who said most breast cancer patients have no reoccurrence. But is there an actual statistic number about an overall or general reoccurrence? So that's a great question. <laughs> um, that is going to be typically, I think, less than 10% of patients are ever going to have a recurrence. Um, and typically, um, like I mentioned earlier, those, even if there is a recurrence, it is typically very local, completely treatable and quite survivable. Right, I know we see on the media a lot where, you know, they'll have a story that somebody had breast cancer. I get this question all the time. I saw so-and-so, she had breast cancer 20, 30 years ago, and now it's in her spine, and I didn't think that could happen, and does that happen, and how often does that happen? And, and to be honest with you, it really doesn't happen that often. Is it impossible? No. Um, it's not very likely, uh, and again, maybe Dr. Zachariah can chime in. Some of the survival rates and Longevity, again, has to do with what specific subtype you had, what stage were you. Um, usually we tell people if, if you've done kind of everything we've asked with surgery and radiation and chemotherapy, we like to get your recurrence risk down to about 2 to 5 percent, less than 10 percent. It's a kind of a variable question. Yeah, I, I, overall, including all cancers, all stages, uh, it, it's, uh, it's hard to ask, uh, hard to answer just because it's so variable, just like the, the treatment is so variable. Why some people get chemotherapy and some people can just do a pill or some people don't need anything at all besides you know, surgery or, uh, or maybe radiation. So it's, it's hard to say uh, exactly for each individual person. But um, overall, it'll be less than 10%. Less than but the, the stories that Dr. Colfrey was alluding to, breast cancer is the most common cancer in the world. And when you just have that many cases around, you're going to hear the, the bad stories, unfortunately, the, the small percentage. Um, but and I say this to all my patients is most people that do well, you don't hear about it because they don't want to go telling everybody that they, they did well. So the, the truth is that most breast cancer patients that, that do well, you won't know about it and you'll hear about those, those unfortunate, uh, unfortunate cases. But by sheer, sheer statistics of it being so common, you will get that happen every now and then. But the numbers are very small. It's one of the most curable cancers that we have. 
Those were fantastic questions. Let's please give a round of applause to our incredible <laughs> panelists tonight. If you didn't get the chance to ask your question, maybe you're a little nervous, I understand. They will be around mingling throughout the night, so please say thank you, ask whatever questions you may have, and um, we're gonna continue on with the night. Thank you again to our incredible panel. So we know women's health is top of the mind for this month, yet a lot of health problems we know can just come up at any day of the year, right? So we want to encourage every single one of you here tonight to tell a friend, to tell another friend, to tell that friend to be proactive and to make sure that you take care of your health, invest in yourself as well as your well-being. Self-care is key. While our physicians have exited the stage, and we thank you so much again, I would like to reiterate the point that they made about the high incidence of breast cancer in our community. As you heard tonight, it is the most common cancer diagnosed at Toro. And the number of cases just go up year after year. But providing the women in our community with advanced treatment options and a compassionate, comprehensive team is so important. That is crucial. So tonight, you heard it here first, breaking news, right? You hear the news sound in your head right now? Toro is developing a breast care center set to open next year. You heard it here first. I was diagnosed with breast cancer in July 2007. I was diagnosed approximately 18 years ago with breast cancer, stage one. Stage two invasive ductal carcinoma. I found out that I had triple positive breast cancer. It was the stage four and he said it was incurable. Just the, the idea of cancer, okay, that's such a horrible word, a signal word. At Soro, we care for more breast cancer patients than any other cancer type. Year over year, we have seen an increase in patients diagnosed with breast cancer. Over the next 10 years, the incidence of breast cancer in our community is expected to grow by 12.7%. This is why Toro is investing $3 million into development of a state-of-the-art breast care center. The creation of the breast care center will serve as New Orleans' epicenter for advanced breast cancer services and provide our growing breast cancer patient population a caring and healing environment for cancer care. The Breast Cancer Center combines providers from all specialties, including radiology, surgical oncology, radiation oncology, medical oncology, and supportive care services, all in one central location. The dedicated team utilizes a collaborative care model to support patients from diagnosis through treatment and into survivorship. We work together to develop individualized treatment plans and review advanced treatment options, including clinical trials to provide each patient with the best care possible. The Breast Care Center brings the advanced quality care you know and trust from Turo to a dedicated outpatient center designed exclusively for treating breast cancer patients. The new Breast Care Center at Toro will feature advanced breast imaging services, a multidisciplinary clinic for surgical, medical oncology, and radiation oncology, patient navigation with dedicated navigators to work directly with patients to manage their personalized treatment plan and coordinate with their care team, support services including psychosocial support, nutrition, pain management, and outpatient cancer rehabilitation consultations. Patient boutique with headscarves, wigs, prosthetic bras, and other patient necessities. And consultation rooms for support group meetings and multidisciplinary team meetings. The team that you choose to care for you following a cancer diagnosis is an important personal choice. Our team at Toro continues to innovate and be leaders in our field. We focus on treating you as the whole person, not just a disease, and we utilize the latest research and technology to fight cancer head on. 
We have all been touched by breast cancer and know the feeling of wanting ourselves or our loved ones to receive the best care available. I feel like I'm in the best place and the best hands. All my doctors are here and I love all of them. I know I'm not their only patient, but to be honest, I feel like I am. They have taken the worry from me, put it all on them. It's almost like family. You can't ask for more than that. Join Turo as we bring extraordinary breast cancer care to our community. Wow. That is incredible. Congratulations, Toro, for all of your success so far and the future of Breast Care Center. It's going to be amazing. That was such a powerful video. And it's just really so exciting to have this team of physicians and level of technology and treatment available to breast cancer survivors all across our community. If you would like more information on the Breast Care Center or how you can support the campaign for extraordinary breast cancer care, you do have some booklets right at your seats or you can always go to Toro.com. That is remarkable. I just want to thank each and every one of you again for joining us this evening, being here tonight. It is just, it's just so exciting to be in person. Really, it is. I mean, it, to see each and every one of you face to face, uh, to be able to connect, to be able to hear from our incredible team of physicians and to get that breaking news about the Breast Care Center at Tour. I mean, it's just what a night and what an honor. So thank you all so much. At this time, all of the stations are open. Be sure to eat, drink, be pampered, and celebrate an evening with this amazing group of women. Before we go, I gotta roll it back to 2019 like we did. We did a video and I had everyone say pampered and pink because this is a celebration. We're in person and I'm just so happy to be here. <laughs> so on the count of three, I need everyone to say pampered and pink. Are you ready? One, two, three. Pampered. Give a round of applause to Toro tonight. <laughs> Social media, right? Um, please remember to keep those fun and festive pink masks on as you all are walking around the stations this evening. Have fun, chat with the doctors. Thank you so much for coming tonight and thank you Toro for having me again. <laughs>